Hi everyone, today we're going to be discussing the formation of the aortic arches and how they contribute to the mature and final blood supply that we see in gross anatomy. This process is very complicated and very difficult to visualize, so these accompanying illustrations are not going to be 100% accurate in terms of the timing and size, but they will show the overall morphology that we're trying to make sense of and hopefully clarify the situation a little bit. We'll start off right here in the center of the chest with an incredibly realistic looking heart, which leads to an outflow tract pumping blood to the truncus arteriosus. From there, the blood would enter a common, uh, common chamber called the aortic sac, and from the aortic sac, it would be distributed through several aortic arches to finally reach the dorsal aorta, the paired aorta, along the back of the body, which then fuse to form a single dorsal aorta, a little more caudally, closer to the tail. And I say tail because these aortic arches are what actually form the gill arch blood supply in fish. These structures still form in humans and other mammals, but they are, instead of being used for gills, put to work and morphologically changed to become the carotid arteries, the subclavian arteries, the aorta, and other associated structures that we see in the upper mediastinum and proximal upper limb and neck. So what we're going to do is move from this arrangement here to something that looks a little more typical. We have the ascending aorta leading to the aortic arch. And from there we have three branches. The first is the brachiocephalic trunk, which splits into a right common carotid, which in turn splits into an internal and external branch going to the brain and the head, respectively. The right subclavian artery goes to the right upper limb. The second branch is the left common carotid artery, again branching into an internal and external branch. And finally, the third branch off the aorta most times is the left subclavian artery. And the aorta continues inferiorly, and the descending aorta goes to the thorax, abdomen, and eventually splits to become the two common iliac arteries in the pelvis. Now along with this system, which is receiving blood from the left ventricle of the heart, we've got the pulmonary trunk receiving blood from the right ventricle, splitting to form a right and left pulmonary artery. And lastly, we've got a little wedge of tissue located right here that represents an earlier vessel that closed called the ligamentum arteriosum, representing the ductus arteriosus that was active earlier in life. So going from one state of affairs to this convoluted and fairly complex system takes several steps. I'm going to illustrate that as easily as we can. The final product goes like this. Quick summary of what we're going to be seeing is that, that truncus arteriosus, the outflow tract, will form part of the proximal aorta, ascending aorta, as well as the pulmonary trunk, both of the major outflow vessels. The aortic sac, likewise, will become part of the ascending aorta and also part of the right brachiocephalic trunk going to the right limb and the right head. There will be really six aortic arches altogether with a slight modification of that. The first and second form, but go away very quickly. They may leave little tiny vessels in the middle ear, but we're not going to worry about those. The third aortic arch forms the right and left common carotid arteries, as well as the internal carotid artery. The fourth arch is pretty strange. On the right side, it forms part of the subclavian artery, and on the left, part of the aortic arch itself. Now, a fifth arch has been described in other animals, and was actually described in those animals first. And when it was looked for in humans, we don't have one. That structure either disappears very quickly or never comes into existence at all. So there is no fifth arch in humans, but somewhat perversely, we do have a sixth arch. So when we count aortic arches in humans, one, two, three, four, six. The sixth arch uh, creates the pulmonary trunk and is going to form the right pulmonary artery, the left pulmonary artery, and that ductus arteriosus that we mentioned earlier that is going to close up and become the ligamentum arteriosum. Lastly, the two paired dorsal aorta are going to also turn into things. The right dorsal aorta becomes part of the right subclavian artery, going to the right upper limb, and the left dorsal aorta remains the aorta forms a lot of the arch and almost all of the descending aorta. Now we've gone through the basics, let's go through how it looks. Once again, fairly stylized drawing here with the heart leading to the aortic sac. Early in development we have a first aortic arch on each side that forms and meets up with the dorsal aorta on either side and goes to a common outflow in a single dorsal aorta a little further down. 
If we take a look at this slightly obliquely, what we see is the heart pumping blood through the aortic sac to the first arch and along the dorsal aorta. This is located dorsal to the gut tube, which is forming here in yellow, but ventral to the developing brain and spine, the central nervous system, which will be shown in blue hereafter. Now we go a little bit further along a development and this process just starts adding arches. The first arch is still there in orange, but we now have second aortic arch in sky blue, leading off the aortic sac to the dorsal aorta. At this point, we're getting what's referred to as intersegmental arteries. These are little branches that are stretching out to the surrounding tissue and supplying blood to it. And they're somewhat important, but the one that's the most important is the seventh intersegmental, which we'll get to very briefly. Here, we've got the same view from the oblique side. Notice that in the process of forming multiple arches, we've pinched off a little bit of the pharynx, or the developing gut tube, and this is going to be the first and second pharyngeal pouch, and that's a topic for another developmental lecture altogether. But the first and second arch run dorsally to get to the dorsal aorta, and we've got intersegmental branches jumping off the dorsal aorta thereafter. We move a little further along, and now things are getting interesting. The first and second arches start to degenerate, but the third and fourth arch come into existence and start carrying most of the blood from the aortic sac to the dorsal aorta. Notice we've got intersegmental arteries again, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and between the first and seventh intersegmental arteries we get a bridging vessel that grows between these guys and starts elongating cranially or towards the head. Here's a view from the side, a little more complicated. First, second, third, fourth aortic arches are associating with first, second, third, fourth pharyngeal pouches, which will form various glands and other structures, but they're all stretching towards the dorsal aorta, but at the same time, from the seventh to the first intersegmental artery, we're having a vessel that's starting to reach cranially towards the base of the brain right here. And I'd also like to point out, off of the gut tube, we've got our respiratory diverticulum, aka the lung bud, which is blebbing off and will soon split into two separate lung buds on the left, or pardon me, two separate lung buds, one on the left, one on the right. All right, we move along and we've lost the first and second aortic arches altogether. And we've got the third, the fourth, and no fifth arch. Instead, we're going to have the sixth. But before we get there, look at what's happening between the third and the fourth arch. The dorsal aorta between those two starts to degenerate and starts to detach these two vessels from each other. The sixth arch is remaining attached to the dorsal aorta and is bridged pretty tightly with the fourth arch there. And that elongating artery keeps elongating, keeps growing towards the base of the brain, but right here the seventh starts to grow outward. And at this point we've got a, a limb bud for the forelimb growing out the side of the embryo, and this is supplying blood to that structure. Let's take a look at it from the side. Now, the third aortic arches are reaching up and have formed, or at least met with, a plexus of vessels at the base of the brain. If you guys know your anatomy well, this may be triggering some either reminiscences from lab or flashbacks from lab, depending on how good an experience you had. The fourth arch in yellow is still reaching the dorsal aorta, but the sixth arch is reaching back a little more inferiorly. And the fact that it's closer to these lung buds is very important, and we'll get to that in just a moment. Right here is the seventh intersegmental branch, and if we were to travel outside the embryo, we'd probably see the limb bud growing out at about this point. Third arch and the lung buds are important to pay attention to right here. All right, now it starts to get a little wacky. The third pharyngeal arch, pardon me, the third aortic arch has formed the internal carotid artery, growing off the common carotid artery, and they've grown together at the base of the brain and formed a network from right and left, 
as well as with that elongating artery that has met its neighbor, fused, and also joined into this network. The fourth aortic arch is still hanging out between the dorsal aorta and the aortic sac, as is the sixth aortic arch. But the sixth aortic arches on each side have sent a little branch, which becomes a very big branch, into the developing lung buds. These are going to be the pulmonary arteries and will actually be carrying deoxygenated blood to the lungs over time. Right now, we've got this extended elongated artery off the intersegmental branches. The first through sixth intersegmental arteries start to degenerate. They're not needed anymore. Most of the blood is traveling through this seventh branch and up along this extended branch to reach the base of the brain, with the remainder traveling out to the upper limb and another smaller branch going inferiorly that we'll see just a moment. And if you've been playing along at home, you've probably realized that these pink vessels on either side are going to form the vertebral artery, which fuse to become the basal artery, which joins the internal carotid arteries at the circle of Willis, at the base of the brain. Subclavian off the inter seventh intersegmental, and the one that I was alluding to a moment ago is the internal thoracic artery, which will wind up in the front of our chest, just posterior to the sternum. Now take a look at the dorsal aorta, because something very strange is happening here. The left side is remaining intact and remaining connected with the rest of the descending aorta, but the right side is degenerating, and this will soon detach. So the degenerating right dorsal aorta is going to split, connecting this side, the right side, more strongly with the subclavian artery than with anything else. And at the same time as the lungs are getting their blood supply, the heart is beginning to partition the great vessels. So the aorta and the pulmonary trunk are coming into existence as the truncus arteriosus grows some ridges in between to make those vessels segregate and associate only with the left ventricle in the case of the aorta and the right ventricle in the case of the pulmonary trunk. Here's a view from the side. Third and vertebrals by the basilar meet at the circle of Willis. The fourth is associating with the dorsal aorta on both sides, but the dorsal aorta on the right is degenerating, making the major blood supply to the upper limb the major connection on the right. However, on the left, the dorsal aorta remains intact. So in addition to the left upper limb, the left vertebral, and the left internal thoracic, we still have blood traveling down through the body in the descending aorta. And this is looking a little more like what we're used to, I hope. The internal carotid arteries are connected back to the early aortic sac, just past there is the fourth aortic arch. On the left, it forms part of the arch of the aorta. Sixth aortic arch is forming the pulmonary arteries, but on the left, it retained its connection to the dorsal aorta. That's going to be the ductus arteriosus. But this little strip between the dorsal aorta and the sixth arch degenerates on the right side and separates completely. Pulmonary arteries are still there. The vertebral arteries from the intersegmentals fuse to become the basilar, which then joins the circle of Willis along with the internal carotid coming from the third arch. Subclavian on the right travels to the right upper limb and gets its blood supply from what was the dorsal aorta, the fourth arch, and the aortic sac. On the right, it's receiving its blood supply also from the dorsal aorta, the fourth arch, and the aortic sac. The internal thoracic artery is extended inferiorly around the front or anterior aspect of the thorax and is starting to meet up with branches that are coming off of the aorta more posteriorly. These lower intersegmental branches are going to become the intercostal arteries, which, if you're familiar with the laboratory, connect anteriorly to the internal thoracics. Here's a little bit more of an oblique view of the same thing going on right here. Third meets the circle of Willis as the internal carotid artery. The vertebrals fuse to make the basilar, also forming 
and contributing to the Circle of Willis. Fourth Arch on the right, pardon me, right here, feeds blood to the right subclavian artery. On the left to the dorsal aorta, then to the right, pardon me, the left subclavian artery and the left internal thoracic and the rest of the dorsal and descending aorta. Sixth arch on the left contributes to the dorsal aorta as the ductus arteriosus, contributes to the lung as the pulmonary artery, and the same thing is happening on the right, except that the connection between the left sixth arch and the left dorsal aorta is dwindling and will disappear. And here we are at our final step. The mature blood vessels have formed, color-coded the same way as before, from the aortic arch, ascending aorta, and pulmonary trunk. Internal and common carotid arteries from the third arch. Arch of the aorta, coming largely from the aortic sac, as is the proximal brachiocephalic trunk. Right subclavian artery from the seventh intersegmental artery, as is the left. Descending aorta from the dorsal aorta. Pulmonary arteries from the sixth aortic arch. And the ligamentum arteriosum from the sixth aortic arch on the left. Internal thoracic arteries and vertebral arteries stretching off of the seventh intersegmental, one going inferiorly down posterior to the sternum, and the other extending superiorly towards the basal artery. Intercostal arteries have moved from the dorsal aorta to meet the internal thoracic, and now I've cut up with the vertebral, fusing to form the basal on the right and left to meet the circle of Willis. All right. That pretty much covers everything you might need to know about formation of the aortic arches. Hopefully it's been a little bit enlightening. Just to make things a little more fun, I'm going to finish off the last bit of the video in silence and just let you see this transformation happen from the straight on view and from the slightly oblique view. I hope you've enjoyed it and have a great day.